Uh, thanks, Jeff. And I apologize uh, for the somewhat less than informative topic uh, name. I tried to get, you know, the, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. So hopefully this will be a little more interesting than the uh, subtitle suggests, but perhaps a little more interesting than the main title. Um, here, just as a quick uh, overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to describe what a, a problem, problem set is that we're going to work on. Um, suggest why this might be of interest to you. We're going to do a end-to-end -end overview of walking through this um, policy-based auto-signing and uh, talk about some related work towards the end, of the, the end of the presentation. Well, first off, what is the problem space that we're talking about? In a word, OpenSSL. Uh, in a larger sense, or more specific sense, um, Puppet's use of SSL is a little bit unusual. Uh, raise your hand if you've had to seek help, and I mean online, although professional mental health is also an option, <laughs> if, you've, uh, if you had to seek help around SSL and Puppet. Almost everybody, yes, M myself included. Anecdotally, this is the number one cause of frustration for people getting started with Puppet. Um, and there's, there's two things specifically that Puppet does with SSL that make it tougher than just connecting to uh, a secure website with your web browser. Um, it, everyone uses SSL all day long, and uh, it almost never causes as much problems as Puppet's SSL does. But there are, a couple, there are two things that we do specifically that make things more difficult. The first one is that client-side certificate authentication is on. So unlike just browsing to a website, it's more like using a certificate to connect to a VPN. The server cares about what the identity is of the, of the uh, certificate that the client presents. And we do some verification steps to make sure that, um, it's, that the client is actually presenting a valid certificate. Uh, I, let me dig digress here, too, because this is actually a cause of some confusion and consternation among, among people. And I just spent uh, some time yesterday with, a, uh, with somebody who was trying to understand which parts of the certificates they needed and which parts they didn't need. There are some things that public cares a lot about in SSL. Um, it cares a lot that from the agent side that the uh, host name that it thinks it's connecting to actually exists in one of the, uh, either the, the subject name or one of the subject alternate names that the server presents, right? So, so that, that DNS name, which is usually Puppet unless you override it with a dash dash server directive, has to exist somewhere on the, on the certificate that the master presents. From the master side, oh, it, from the master side, we, we just make sure that the agent certificate is um, issued by a valid certificate authority, that is one that Puppet knows that it can trust, that its validity period is within the time that's stamped inside the certificate, and so that's a common source of problems. We tried to issue a helpful message, which in fact was sometimes misleading about uh, your, your clocks being out of sync, because validity period is definitely one of the things that is difficult. Yeah, James is hiding his head there. For shame, for shame. No, it's okay. We, tr we tried, to, tried to help and make it informative, but there's actually more things that can go wrong. And having an uh, error message which says, your dates are out of sync, and the user goes, my dates are perfectly in sync. What are you talking about? It's probably not the most, uh, most we, we probably should have he he um, hedged our bets a little bit. Is auto advance on? What's going on here? Um, the, um, the, the second thing is um, uh, uh, PKI, and I mentioned this a, a minute ago, that both the, I'm sorry, there's one more thing that, that, that has to be true about the certificates. The um, serial number of the certificate has to not be in the certificate revocation list. And again, this is a, uh, sometimes a source of confusion. The, name that, the names that are on the certificates are not in the certificate revocation list, only the numbers. And so if through some um, miracle of NFS locking or the lack thereof or, lo or poor locking semantics on your local file system where we write out the serial number. You get two serial numbers issued or two certificates issued with the same serial number and you revoke one of them. Surprise, you've actually broken, revoked both of them. And if the certificate serial number which you revoked happens to exist both on an agent and on your master uh, and you've just accidentally revoked the serial number of your master then much hilarity can ensue. And by hilarity, I mean hair pulling and uh, heavy drinking. Um, so what, like I said, client certificate auth is on, and that's something that you don't usually see when you're connecting to a website. And the second thing is that Puppet issues its own certificates. It, we have a built-in um, public key infrastructure, and um, 
much like, this is the auto advances making me crazy here. Um, we, uh, unlike uh, VeriSign or GeoTrust that issues you a certificate for your uh, website, um, there, there's just a, a, some, some Ruby code which determines whether or not a given certificate ought to be issued. If you go up and sign, for, sign up for a website from GeoTrust, they sort of do some level of assurance to make sure that you are who you say you are, that you have the right to the domain name that you are claiming to uh, present a certificate for. Although I seem to recall that someone was able to spoof uh, being Microsoft.com uh, and get a GeoTrust certificate issued that with, with a Microsoft.com domain name, which, and again, hilarity ensued. Um, so that being the case, the question of how you trust a new signing certificate request comes into play. But what's the real problem here? So that's fine, but what's the real problem? Is this, I may, may unplug the clicker because I feel like I'm getting spurious advances. Um, the real problem is uh, uh, described in the comment here, and this is from uh, Puppet 3.2 or thereabouts. It says whether, the comment says whether we're gonna enable auto sign. The valid values are true, you can auto sign anything, so any certificate re request comes in, sure, just give them a certificate. Uh, we have a little editorial commentary here, this is a very bad idea. False, never auto signs any key request. This is how uh, Puppet Enterprise ships normally and requires some manual intervention to do a, a certificate issuance. Or the path to a file, which uses the configuration file to determine which keys to sign. And uh, this is the, the autosign.conf, which was previously the, uh, the only way to have some kind of automation or some kind of control that wasn't all the way yes or all the way no about which hosts ought to get certificates issued to them. Um, so this model made sense when hosts came and went rarely, but if you're playing along with the uh, puppet, drink, puppet conf drinking game, it's time to take a, pets not, or a cattle not pets drink. Um, this, uh, if, if, you, if you remember puppet conf 2012, uh, Tim Bell gave a talk there, uh, he works at CERN, and he used this slide. Um, they didn't actually come up with this metaphor at CERN, but they popularized it, I believe because they had a cute kitten on the slide, and that tends to enhance your uh, brand engagement quite a bit. At CERN, they moved from a system called Quator, which um, in 2004 was all the rage in homespun configuration management systems, um, but had sort of outlived its usefulness, and they wanted to move to a more standards-based approach built around OpenStack uh, and, and Puppet. And um, the, this slide represents the transformation that they underwent. The, um, you know, in the pets model, you, in addition to giving your machines unique names and care for, caring for them, and uh, as Luke said this morning, forming emotional attachments with them, nursing them back to help when they get ill, one of the other uh, characteristics of that that's germane to this talk is that you would really care about issuing them a certificate and care a lot about, um, you know, you, when a new certificate re request came in, you'd inspect it very carefully and uh, make sure that the fingerprints matched up with the, re with the request that came in and the issue date was okay and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's a very, that's a very pet-centric model of issuing certs. In the, uh, this new herd-based world, we care a lot less about what the individual host names are um, and when they get ill, you don't necessarily care to spend thousands of dollars on vet bills to nurse it back to health, you just get another one. It's a little cruel, I, I confess, but um, uh, when you're dealing with tons and tons of servers, it makes a lot more sense. Um, we don't really live in, a, in the computers as pets world anymore. Does anyone know where this is? NSA. Can you say where it is? Yeah, the, so this is the NSA headquarters in Fort Meade, Maryland. The NSA uses um, more electricity than any other entity in the state of Maryland uh, running, their, running their compute farms uh, for, bless you, for purposes that nobody knows. I'm gonna extend this, uh, this concept of power consumption as a proximate metric for the size and therefore the complexity of your compute infrastructure for a couple of more examples and convince you that there's fundamentally a discontinuity between the way things were and their current state, and therefore uh, we need to ad adapt our models correspondingly. Um, so this is uh, the, an Apple data center uh, in Maiden, North Carolina. It's a really cool place. I worked out of there 
uh, for a week when I worked on iCloud to help get the data center teams up and running on Puppet. Just for, for uh, purposes of visual scale, this um, right rectangle up in the sort of upper right corner is a uh, the container off of an 18-wheeler. So that kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the place. It's, it's huge. It's, um, they have a lot of computers there. I actually got lost while I was visiting, um, but f it, wandering through the racks. But fortunately, they have uh, emergency food stashes at the end of each of the aisles. So I was able to sort of build a campfire and huddle around until <laughs> the rescue team came and got me. They built a giant solar farm across the street, and Apple likes to talk about how their data centers are uh, the, some of the cleanest powered data centers in the world. Um, and, but primarily, that's because they invested this huge amount of money in, in building um, solar and fuel cell um, power infrastructure to power them, because while well, it's in North Carolina, and 95% of the power that comes off of the grid in North Carolina is coal-based. So without offsetting that in some way, they're actually the dirtiest power centers in the world, which is counter to the myth of Apple. So uh, they, they um, you know, we used AutoSign when I worked in here for this whole facility. It was, it, we knew it was bad. Uh, I knew it was, uh, as the comment said, the wrong, uh, a very bad idea and the wrong thing to do, but it was the best option I had available to me. And we sort of controlled the perimeter and figured, well, if we have control over the perimeter and which host can request certificates, then we have a pretty good uh, degree of assurance that if somebody wants to uh, send in a certificate request, have us auto sign them a certificate and put their computer under control of my puppet infrastructure, that's probably OK. Like, I don't care that much. Um, but obviously, that model, again, doesn't, doesn't work everywhere. Um, Sometimes, if you live in Cloud City, um, on the planet of Bespin, it's not true at all that you control the perimeter. Um, in addition to having Lando Calrissian as your mayor, which is awesome, you probably also have hosts that come and go pretty frequently if you live in the cloud. Their host names aren't super meaningful, and you're not going to nurse them back to health if something goes wrong. Um, as far as the power, uh, power generation metric, um, I did a little research for this talk because uh, I didn't know this offhand. Shame on me. But apparently, Bespin's whole economy, the whole gas giant economy, was based on uh, mining Tibana gas. Not Kibana, that's different, but Tibana with a T. Uh, they are the gaseous emissions of these giant beasts that live down in the high density zone in the center, towards the center of the gas cloud, or the gas planet. Um, and they uh, power blasters and hyperdrives and all that sort of stuff. And presumably, uh, the gas also fuels their data centers, although they never showed it. And presumably, they also keep, use some of that power to keep this thing floating in midair without any visible means of propulsion. I'm not sure how that works either. Science. But yeah, science. I read it in Wikipedia, so I know it's true. <laughs> so my disclaimer here is that I do not personally live in Cloud City. I'm, uh, I, in fact, I undertook a lot of the work to put this presentation together in order to familiarize myself with a lot of the Amazon uh, APIs, which I have not used in production. I came from the the previous world here, where we had tons of servers, but I ran them all, and they were mostly uh, you know, cared about the, the uh, bare metal and the, the physical provisioning, and much less about um, the cloud provisioning. So this is, this is a pretty interesting um, uh, approach for me. One more example, and then I'll move on. Uh, but this is my favorite. I couldn't pass up the opportunity to, uh, to do this. this is, these are also uh, mining rigs, much like uh, Cloud City was, except they mine bitcoins. Um, this is in somebody's garage, and uh, you know, so even if you're not at giant scale, you probably also have a lot of computers. They might be sitting in your garage, just running, uh, um, mining on the on the um, a on the ASICs or the graphics hardware. But they also end up using a lot of power. It turns out, and uh, these guys turn to a, uh, a wind power based solution. <laughs> Plus, they, uh, the thing I love about this picture is they reuse the, uh, the boxes that the fans came in and, in order to build a monitor stand for themselves. <laughs> so it's recycling. It's, it's awesome. That's some green power right there. Yeah. I guess the point is that everybody has a ton of computers these days, and it's kind of a pain in the butt or a pain in the butt coins to manage them all individually. Even if you don't have a huge mining rig, either for cryptocurrency or some kind of miracle gas, or e even if you don't have a cell phone metadata collection facility, you probably want to build some kind of automation around which machines get issued certificates. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, 
This is a quick block diagram of the different pieces that I'm going to talk through as an overview, and uh, the URL if you want to check out the, the work uh, and follow, follow along on your, on your laptop. Um, and by the way, if you came up, uh, as I did, on uh, the draw uh, for BBS art and uh, reading RF the diagrams and, uh, for RFCs, uh, ASCIIflow.com, I highly recommend it. It lets you draw these kind of graphs just by dra drag and drop in boxes. It's totally awesome. Um, so we're going to use a, a provisioning node to talk to EC2, which is going to create some instances for us. They bootstrap themselves. They'll create certificate requests. Uh, the certificate requests go into the Puppet Master there in the, the center bottom. The Puppet Master checks against the EC2 API to make sure that they're supposed to be signed, and if so, it signs them. And when those nodes check in for real, the instance, the, uh, the data that they, that's embedded in the certificate request will get turned into the certificate, which is awesome and kind of a new thing that we added. And then that becomes available to Puppet as special trusted facts so that we can use it in our manifests. So this is the end-to-end -end kind, of, kind of workflow, and then I'll, I'll dive into each of, the, each of the pieces here. So first part, there's a couple of prerequis prerequisites that you need. Um, you need a pub master with some um, AM credentials and auto sign policy to be configured. Um, and you need an AMI, uh, uh, some kind of image, either with uh, um, user data uh, that has a, the, the provisioning script, which is in the in that GitHub repo, or um, uh, the preloaded uh, agent EC2 utils, and a policy permitting the, the agent to query the tags. And I'll talk about that in a sec. In fact, I'll talk about that now. So I got into will I, will I am, because he has, he has the I am policy. Um, this is <laughs> identity and access management. Um, and it, you know, it lets you make users and privileges that are role -based, you know, use role-based access control and are not given the keys to the kingdom on your, your root EC2 account, which is kind of a good thing. One thing that is, I think, less well-known, because I had to do a little digging to find it out, it also lets you do delegated security policy out to other resources in Amazon's ecosystem. So you can actually make an IAM policy that applies to machines that live in Amazon and not necessarily uh, to an individual user who's logged in. Normal use of it is to say, okay, we'll let this person launch, insta launch instances of just the size or um, uh, only, only let them launch it in these availability zones. But uh, the machines are also subject to IAM policy. So this one per permits any of my instances, uh, instances to get at their uh, tags through the API. Normally, this is not possible. You know, there's the metadata um, kind of fake web server that, it, that you can query from an Amazon instance and pull back stuff about, about that, the instance that's running from it locally. But uh, there's a two-year-old bug uh, for adding tags to the list of things that are available that um, has not seen any traction. So uh, go, go out and plus one it if it affects you. Um, the workaround is to put the EC2 utils actually on the host and then use the, um, the API with, in conjunction with this policy to get the tags out. So that's what I ended up doing. All right. So in this case, uh, as I said, your, your provisioning node is going to request some new instances. This is the, kind of the first step. I use the uh, Puppet um, node AWS tool to do this originally. And uh, Vincent actually helped me out yesterday, and we realized that this uh, was not a complete solution. I, f I started out launching them from the web interface, and that worked out beautifully. Then I moved over to um, Cloud Provisioner, which has not gotten a lot of love lately and, and uh, needs, to, needs some updated. There's no way from Cloud Provisioner right now to set that IAM policy for the nodes. So I launched nodes that couldn't make use of that policy. And once it's active, you can't retroactively go back and add it to them. So this actually is up here to show that it's theoretically possible, not that it actually worked. Um, but, but um, yeah, I think it's, it is support. We determined that it is supported in the underlying FOG library, so it's probably just a little bit of hacking to get it working. But um, I was already tired enough, so I just kept, kept plowing through. Um, I went back um, to the web interface and built, the, built out some images. They dropped um, uh, this user data script, which is kind of a cool thing. I have, uh, it's, it basically feeds straight into um, a tool called CloudInit, which is a pretty handy thing that runs at uh, the 
or very early in the bootstrap time, bootstrap cycle of the machine, and lets you do arbitrary commands. It's kind of like a little mini configuration uh, configuration management language that's uh, mostly for doing provisioning kind of tasks, but you can do pretty much anything in there. In this case, what I have it do is run uh, some of this instance-specific metadata into uh, a file that Puppet will know to look for when it requests the certificate. So as you can see in this uh, little snippet, which is from the um, one of the uh, files that's in the, it's from the EL6 uh, sc uh, script that's in the module. Um, we're doing some curls against the metadata uh, web server to pull out the availability zone, instance ID, and the AMI ID, and then running that EC2 describe tags command against the API to get the, t get the tags out. Um, and then I drop all of those into a YAML file that uh, is in a, as I said, in a place where Puppet will know to look for it once uh, it starts up and tries to request a certificate. And uh, in our docs, I think I used a better pre-shared key than this one. This one is actually, yeah, I just ran the UID command to, to get it in there. But uh, um, apparently some people are using my super secret password in production, which is kind of cool. Um, Oh, sure. So this, this, this script is, oh, sure, I'm sorry. The question was, how does this, how does this actually get onto the instance? And this, uh, this script goes into the uh, user data field as I'm launching the, uh, the, the AMI, right? So there's, a, there's an option as when you go through the web interface or if you use a tool to launch it that says, hey, incorporate this into the user data. You could either put this, bake this onto your AMI if you wanted to put it uh, inside the CloudInet directory, and I think I have a, the exact path to do that in the, in the docs, or you can just put it into the user data field literally in the, in the web form, and that causes it to get executed really early in the, in the bootstrap before a puppet runs or before anything else happens. Um, yep, does that make sense? Yeah, so, uh, well, if it's your own AMI, I mean, you might, you might, it's not, it's not too bad, a, bad of a thing to bake it in there. This, mo this is mostly, there's, it's kind of like a belt and suspenders approach, which I'll talk about in a sec, but that's a, fun, that's a fair point. Yeah, you might not want to bake it in. Um, so once this, once this happens, Puppet will start up, and um, we go, wait, check that out. Uh, Puppet will generate the CSR as soon as it sees that it is starting up without a certificate. It will embed the metadata out of that YAML file into the certificate signing request and send it off to the master. Um, the master receives the request and uh, checks against uh, EC2 to verify that it came from a valid instance. So there's a little script that uh, actually queries the API and says, hey, I got this instance ID from the certificate. Uh, did, is, is there a real instance under my account that has that same ID? And if so, if so, the Puppet Master signs the CSR, it moves the tags, the instance ID, and any other metadata in the extension request into the signed certificate. And then it's retrieved by the node and normal Puppet runs can begin. Sorry, I apologize for just having read that slide. I didn't even realize I was doing that. Um, so, so this is kind of neat. There's a, couple, there's a couple of things that happen. You can verify this by looking at the certificate once it's issued. Uh, you can go into the CA or onto the host and use the OpenSSL X509 tool, which is proof that um, Puppet is not the only command line tool in the Unix ecosystem with a horrendous command line interface. Uh, if anything, the OpenSSL tool is um, probably the worst thing I've ever used in terms of trying to string together a useful command line. Um, but it does work. It does out, you know, take in tons of crap and output um, more crap. The, um, one of the things that it outputs when you run this command is, is these extensions, and you can see that they're embedded in there. There are some OIDs, and the, uh, they're, these are real object IDs in a sense that they belong to Puppet Labs, and we have them embedded into the um, Puppet code base, which recognizes them uh, and will turn them into meaningful variables once we hit the, the DSL, which we'll see in a minute. Any questions at this point? Links there. The question was, was I running the Puppet Master in EC2 or in another data center? The answer is in EC2, but it doesn't actually matter. Port 8140 has to be open, and it has to, from an outbound 
from an outbound access standpoint, it has to be able to hit the EC2 web API. So that might be a little bit unusual, I guess, from a security policy standpoint, if you have stuff that's on, on premise. Um, some people have problem masters that are sort of in the innermost circle inside their, their firewalls, and so it might be a little difficult to make that, make that happen. But if you have some instances outside and some inside, you're going to have to do that anyways. Um, a couple of more pre-seed things have to happen once in order for this complete workflow to work. Um, these, these two commands or settings on the, on the master will be the default in Puppet 4, but for now you have to turn them on uh, in the master section. The first one, trusted, no data equals true, makes this um, top scope dollar trusted hash available for um, as, you're, as we're compiling manifests. And the second one, immutable no data, throws an error if you try to add anything to the tr dollar trusted hash from inside Puppet itself. Uh, so it makes it so that you can't uh, later mod you can't cannot be appended to by facts from the host. So otherwise, you could just go in and you know say make a make a data structure that's called trusted and put whatever you want in there, and it wouldn't actually be trusted. Uh, so the immutability, basically you would want to turn these things on in conjunction, and I believe the setting for the second one is derived from the setting for the first one, so it's a little bit redundant to set them both, but I wanted to describe them both to show that there's actually two, two things at play here. Um, and, the, and the idea here was that if people, for some reason, already had a top scope variable that was called trusted in their infrastructure, we wanted that to be really obvious that, they, that, they were not, you know, that it was going to conflict with the stuff that came from the, uh, from the certificate. And lo and behold, if we have a manifest that's, you know, does something even kind of trivial, like put a, um, a notify that expands out that trusted hash, what you see is, ac is actually somewhat interesting, and there may be some use outside of just doing the certificates. Uh, uh, their extensions are inside a hash key that's called extensions, and you see each of the two, you see the two named ones, which I had, as well as this dot five, which I have a pull request in to add that as pp underscore uh, role, but um, it's not, not merged yet, so I just used the temporary OID there. And you can do this your own, uh, on your own site, too, if you had other uh, data that had client-side truth that you wanted to make available on the server, uh, but didn't fit into any of the pre-assigned names. Feel free to assign your own object IDs actually under uh, up one level from the dot five. So instead of dot one dot five, if you did dot two, that's a private range that we reserved in the OIDs that you can just do whatever you want inside your inside your organization, and uh, it's won't just won't be able to span organizations, and it won't be registered inside of Puppet itself. But the dot one dot one through whatever will will be um, reserved for Puppet use. Additionally, if you have uses for this that are not that don't fall into the category of stuff that. Um, uh, is already in one of the pre-assigned names. Just send a ticket or a pull request or s kick off a discussion on the mailing list because it's, it's literally just a list of registered numbers to names mappings that we keep in the code base and it's super easy to update. But when you do that, so, so in addition to those hash keys for the extensions, we also see uh, the, the name of the cert, which was actually, uh, I was explaining this to the Spotify guys earlier uh, outside, and, and this was actually the genesis for this whole sort of stream of work was uh, one of the, uh, Chris Spence, one of the professional services engineers from the UK, noticed that uh, you could set cert name as a fact on an agent, and that would be reflected on the master as it was compiling catalogs. So in a sense, it was sort of a security hole. In another sense, it was a security hole that was big enough that you could drive a tractor trailer through. Uh, if you were making classification decisions, and particularly a decision on whether or not a node should get a password or get uh, you know, some kind of sensitive data based on the, the assumption that the certificate name was something that was strongly authenticated or it had the word certificate in it and therefore it was secure. Uh, not, not so, unfortunately. So that started this idea of, well, how could we put something that, was, that had stronger guarantees around its, its uh, security in there? And so this cert name is actually pulled off of the certificate um, and pass through into, into Puppet along with the request, as well as that authenticated flag, which says that it was remote. If you run Puppet apply, I believe it just says authenticated as local uh, to indicate that, yes, yeah, sure, it, it didn't come in over the network, but there is some, uh, uh, it's, it's something. 
Um, and I just have a couple of minutes, so let me, let me mention some related work. So this, uh, this module uh, came from Chris Barker originally, um, and it's available on the Forge as Cert Signer, although it doesn't have some of the changes that I made for this talk. There's a related one that Ryan Coleman gave a talk on um, at a public camp, which I believe is posted, that uses, it does the exact same workflow, but uses uh, Google Compute Engine as the API to talk to, as well as the place to launch instances, and that's, that's pretty cool. Um, you could conceivably extend this pretty easily to do a signing policy for an in-house CMDB. Spotify do this. They query against a, a configuration management database that's their internal source of truth for what instances exist and make sure that they are in a valid state to have a certificate signed before uh, actually issuing it. And you can also use the, uh, that trusted hash inside the node manager that uh, Dan Porter dem demoed this morning and use that to make classification decisions uh, for, for your nodes if you're using the new node classifier. So that's all I have. Now you can uh, throw fireballs, go, go forth and be awesome. When Mario gets the sun, he can get, gain superpowers. I also um, looked really, really hard for somebody that was uh, not Mario throwing fireballs and that wasn't uh, in a ridiculous fantasy art um, skin-tight costume, so I did, I did what I could. Um, that's much better. So go, go forth and throw fireballs. Be awesome. Have fun. Thank you. And I guess we, ha we have uh, a few minutes for questions if there are more questions. Uh, go ahead. If someone, yeah, so the concern was if somebody had the pre-shared key off of the, I mean, it's, the, it's a problem with pre-shared keys in general, sure. I mean, presumably you would, if you cared a lot about that, you would rotate it. It's a, it's a mechanism that was available in X509, so which we made use of. Um, it's nice to have both, like I said, it's a belt and suspenders approach. I would want to have that. And I, I check in the um, auto signer Ruby that's, that's in the Git repository, I check to make sure that the pre-shared key is there before trying to instantiate anything against the API, just to, if it's com a completely bogus request, we can throw it out without even doing any network access whatsoever. And if not, then we'll go out and hit the network. Um, I wouldn't use just the pre-shared key for exactly the reason you described, or I'd maybe rotate it out frequently. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a mechanism that was there, and so we, we decided to make use of it. I, I would say that the, cons the, con the important part is that consulting the source of truth over the network that you actually believe to be, to be true is actually the, the important part of the policy and the pre-shared key is just sort of an added bonus. You can check the certificate name against the... Like the certificate name could be your internal PC hosting. Mm. So you can take that and also do that as part of the validation chain. Vincent says you can, check, you can make sure that the host name is also valid against the API to, make, to get another, another check. Yeah, sorry, I can't see, can't see over there. Okay. Sorry, it's okay. Hey. Why go through this? Yeah, go why? Sure, I get. So the question is, why go through all this complication uh, when the master has access to that data? When the 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 problem is that you, the um, certificate the the certificate is the the request is signed with the agent's private key, which the master doesn't have access to, and we can't modify that certificate signing request and add in new things that are not in there originally without invalidating that. And so, in order to uh, in order to get it get it back without having to re retool it or to have the master have access to the private key, uh, we had to get the data from from the agent side. Does that make sense? 
Okay, thank you.